starts right now. Guess what? Another round of rain for the San Antonio area. We're already seeing some rain droplets right there on our TransGuide camera. We're also timing out what to expect for tomorrow's morning commute. And heat so intense it melted a microwave. We're getting an inside look at the house fire a San Antonio teen escaped from and what her mother is sharing with KSAT tonight. Plus, Uvalde families meeting face to face with the head of DPS coming up the exchange that's being called a bait and switch. But first. OK, so we're already seeing some rain cover some of the roads in the, the San Antonio area, but it is expected to pick up as a lot of people get ready for work tomorrow. And we're going to bring in meteorologist Adam Kasky. The storms are coming, but as I was singing before the newscast, Raindrops keep falling. Yeah, they, on do. My head. <laughs> they do, right? We have some uh, just small light showers out there and even areas of drizzle in between. That's what we're dealing with looking at the radar. Uh, some heavier rain or moderate showers just north of Floresville. Those are headed toward Lavernia. This is all moving south to north. But you look locally and just this little bit of light green here and there. The most recent radar scans indicating varying light areas of rain and again some drizzle in between those showers. Here's the big picture upper level system. It's over New Mexico right now. It did cause higher elevation of snow throughout the Rockies, Colorado down into New Mexico. This upper level swirl is headed our way. It along with a cold front will hit us early tomorrow morning. It'll be good rain but not exactly ideal timing. We'll get more into the timing and how much rain we could see in just a little bit. And though, Adam, can we complain about the timing? We need it, right? Exactly. Yeah, thank you. Now, no, now to new details on a 13 year old girl who escaped a house fire by climbing on her roof. Her mother's actually speaking with KSAT tonight. She tells the night team's Alyssa Cole about the moment she came home to her daughter being rescued and the tragic discovery made in their own front yard. Picking up the pieces, that's what this homeowner is doing after a fire spread throughout her home, causing extensive damage in the kitchen, bathroom, and laundry room. When I pulled into the neighborhood, I saw fire trucks everywhere, so I thought something happened at a neighbor's house. Shortly after, the homeowner, who requested to remain anonymous, realized crews were putting out a fire in her home. Her first concern, her teen daughter, who had stayed home earlier that evening. Apparently, she had woke up, heard the smoke detectors going off, and she was gonna go out her bedroom door, but it was too smoky and so she went out the window and they were able to get her off the roof and they examined her and she was completely fine. Her neighbors saw first responders use a ladder to rescue the teen. We saw her come down and uh, you know, it's good that she got out. While she's grateful her children and husband are safe, she's worried her home is beyond repair. The ceiling was burnt through, um, it's really bad. Like. Like all the cupboards, everything got, was burned up. Outside of finding shelter and planning a way to recover necessities like clothes and food, her family is mourning the loss of their pet. I have four dogs and a cat, and they all made it out except for my cat, Finn. We found him in the front yard. The family pretty much lost everything in this fire, including clothes, food, and toiletries. If you're interested in helping this family get back on their feet, you can visit our website at ksat.com for more details on how. Alyssa Cole, KSAT 12 News. New on the night beat. If you're driving along I-10, chances are you might have seen this. A billboard with a message for the Bear County District Attorney, and he's responding. Gabriel Gallegos was killed in May of 2020 when a wrong way driver hit him. Mariana Campos Jimenez is charged with intoxication manslaughter. But Gallegos' family says the wheels of justice are turning too slow. So they put up the billboard pushing for a trial. I don't know how Gabe's case is going to turn out, but for those other individuals who are going through the same thing we are, I want you to know you can speak up and something can be done because a change has to occur because it's not acceptable. It's like you're being victimized twice. In a statement, the DA's office says COVID-19 put many cases on hold, but adds the Gallegos family has always been a priority for their office and they'll be ready when the case goes to trial. You can read more about this story on KSAT.com. Another news now, a bait and switch. That's how some of the families of Uvalde victims described today's meeting with the director of the Department of Public Safety. They went to Austin expecting answers regarding the response at Rob Elementary during the mass shooting on May 24th. Why didn't they go in there? He should have been, he should have been terminated within 10 minutes. Right. Period. Plain and simple. What were they afraid of, sir? 
uh, you know, everyone is, like I said, everyone's being evaluated. And you just heard from DPS Director Steve McGraw. See, he said that he couldn't provide much information at the request of the Uvalde County District Attorney, Christina Mitchell. So instead of offering answers, McGraw says that the criminal investigation would wrap up by the end of the year. You remember, 21 lives were lost in that shooting. And today, families demanded that McCraw step down from his leadership position, not only for the response, but also for the misinformation that he shared in the case. You, sir, have told lies. You're not in control of your officers, nor are you the leader this great state deserves at the helm of what was once known as one of the best law enforcement agencies. McCraw is refusing to step down, however. Meanwhile, seven DPS officers are under investigation by the agency's inspector general. So far, one has been fired, another suspended, and a third left the department before the investigation could wrap up. A San Antonio area bakery is recalling thousands of its pie products. Check your freezers for the boomerang frozen beef shepherd's pie. Pies baked at the Lone Star Bakery in China Grove are under recall. They have a use by date of September 23rd of next year. Investigators say the pies could have pieces of copper wire inside. You can return them to a store for a refund. Turning now to elections, thousands of voters went to polls in Bear County, bringing total, our total to more than 125,000 ballots cast so far. Meanwhile, the governor's race is still heated tonight as Beto O'Rourke visited with voters in San Antonio today. Incumbent Governor Greg Abbott made his own stops into town on Monday. Early voting runs through November 4th. Election day is November 8th. Now in the meantime, you ready? You ready for Muertos Fest? In two days, Hemisphere is going to be lit with all things Day of the Dead. There are going to be 80 altars there honoring people who have passed on but still remain in our hearts. And there's one that we want you to pay very close attention to because it honors the 19 children and two teachers who were killed in Uvalde five months ago. Students from the art club at Lanier High School created it. And you're about to see all the work that went into that special altar. Welcome to the Lanier Art Club, where everyone is hard at work. Every Thursday after school, under the direction of Miss Jennifer Arce and Mr. Michael O'Neill, students split into groups and create. Paper flowers here and paintings everywhere. Everything handled with precision. It has to be, because all of what you see is dedicated to the 19 students and two teachers who were killed at Robb Elementary May 24th. It's still, you know, kind of weighs heavy. It's in the back of my mind all the time, coming to school. You know. Since class began in August, this group has been working on an altar for the Uvalde victims from Huertos Fest. First, they designed it, and now each piece that will make up the finished product is coming to life. Lexi Nieto is working on something special to honor Jackie Casares. She wanted to be a vet. She wanted to do that because she had, I believe, like four dogs, and she loved them a lot, which I can relate to. I love my cat. I'm working on a desk for Leila Salazar. Each of the 19 Uvalde students will have a desk and they'll surround two bigger desks, which will honor Miss Eva Mireles and Miss Irma Garcia. I knew that they, they love their kids, like they died protecting their kids. And that's something I would do as well, that I was put in the same situation. I would do that for my kids. I have some type of love for them because it was a really sad thing that happened. All of this is like they're coming from their own minds. Like they're, they really got involved, really did the research um, for each individual student, as well as the teachers and what they wanted to include on the altar. None of these students or teachers knew the victims, but feel connected to them. Their hope is knowing their loved ones will never be forgotten. I want them to feel like as if their child is there, like if they're being remembered on that day, that's that's what the holiday, the purpose of the holiday is to not forget your loved one, to honor them that day, to keep them alive. Definitely struck by those images there when I visited that school. Those students have done a wonderful job. The reason that you didn't see the the finished product is because when I went, they weren't finished, but you are going to see it when you go to Muertos Fest this Saturday at Hemisphere. And here's the deal. If you scan the QR code on your screen, you can get more information, tons of stuff for you to know. And if you can't make it to Hemisphere for the festival, it's easy. You just tune in for a primetime special. It airs Sunday at 8 p.m. right here on KSAT 12, KSAT.com, and KSAT Plus. Definitely looking forward to it. Coming up, we take a peek inside a San Antonio store run by, get this, 
a self-proclaimed vampire. Do I sleep in a casket at home? I'll never tell. While she won't say if she sleeps in a coffin, there is a coffin that's bringing in curious visitors. We take a look at what's inside that coffin. Coming up. Plus, a popular pizza place by the quarry and an Asian restaurant near Southtown among the places getting a visit behind the kitchen door. The permit problems that were uncovered. Yeah, we got to talk. It's next on The Night Beat. Welcome back. A popular pizza place got its permit suspended while a sports bar is cited for operating without a permit. And employees at a Mexican restaurant need to do a better job of washing their hands. The night team's Tim Gerber goes behind the kitchen door to see if the businesses have made corrections. El Puesto Mexican restaurant earned a 79 on their recent inspection, but you wouldn't know it based on the old score posted on the front door. This time around, they were cited for having boxed potatoes on top of an open garbage can, and they had to toss out incorrectly dated foods in a walk-in cooler. Employees were preparing food with bracelets on, another was wearing nail polish and handling food with their bare hands, and one was seen washing their hands incorrectly. Shelves in the walk-in cooler were rusty, and the walls by the water heater were moldy. Grimaldi's Pizzeria in the 300 block of Bassey got an 82, but had their food permit suspended due to not having hot water. They also needed to clean the inside of the ice machine, the vent hood, and repair a leak on their hand sink. A reinspection was ordered. They were back up and running when we stopped by this week. April Chinese Restaurant in the 2000 block of South Alamo comes in with an 84. They were cited for having a box of raw chicken on the floor. The cold hold unit and walk-in coolers were not maintaining proper temps, and there was food debris in the cold hold, dirty soda nozzles, and dust and debris on the shelf where clean dishes are kept. Squeezing Sports Bar and Club in the 1700 block of General McMullen earned an 84. They were cited for operating without a valid permit, and they owed over $1,000 in fees. They were limited to only selling bottles and cans of beer and bags of chips until several violations were corrected. There was no hot water in the restrooms, and they needed to add some more sinks. I stopped by this week, and employees showed me they now have the proper permits and said they're working on making repairs requested by the inspector. I mean, it gave them till December to fix, like, holes in the walls and, and stuff. Do you know if there's yeah, construction they, they, that's, that's they, ongoing? They, they've been working during the week. That's what's happening behind the kitchen door. Tim Gerber, KSAT 12 News. What to know who has or want to know who has good scores and who doesn't? We have a new tool for that. Just scan this QR code with your phone and it'll take you to a new mapping tool that'll show you all the scores for local food businesses and the reports go back six months and are frequently updated. So you'll have plenty of stuff to look at. Okay, you know what never gets old? A haunted doll. Yeah, apparently we have one in San Antonio. It's at the North Side shop called Stickers and Stars near Thousand Oaks and jo Jones Maltzberger. Self-proclaimed vampire, there she is, Candy Dulcinier runs that shop and you can see it sells costumes and collectibles. But here's the thing, Candy says that a lot of people come to visit Sarah. That's Sarah, the haunted doll in the back. Dulcinea says that she found the doll when she bought a tiny coffin from an oddities dealer and there she was inside. We couldn't get her out. Uh, the coffin is like not just like shut, it's like sealed. It's sealed shut. Is it weird that I don't want to say her name again? All right. <laughs> no, she doesn't seem to stay put because the shop owner thinks the doll is pulling pranks on people, knocking down clowns and literally making customers' hair stand on end. I, maybe she just needs some static guard or something. <laughs> Who knows, right? You know, I wouldn't walk into that store without yeah, some garlic. No, and she's right store. next to a cross. <laughs> no, no, no. All right, now we're giving you a live picture right now. Ooh, where you could see some rain there right now. Uh, that is Donaldson Avenue near Morning Glory on the west side, where you could see it's all decked out there for Halloween, definitely uh, something that looks very Tombstones festive there, right now. Some yes. Ghouls, goblins, possibly. Yeah. And the drizzle and mist to, to <laughs> top it off, right? And uh, the Halloween decorations will be getting damp and maybe even blown over tomorrow, okay? Uh, first thing in the morning, we're going to have some heavier rain and then the gusty winds. Here are the main headlines morning commute. 
damp, wet roads, plenty of water on the roadways, even some heavy rain falling, lightning and thunder. Expect delays. The evening commute tomorrow, just fine. The morning is going to be completely different than the afternoon and evening. It'll be dry, clear, uh, just windy. So Friday night football and any outdoor events, trunk or treat, it's a green light for Friday evening, but just plan for gusty winds and cooler temperatures. Here's a look at radar and you can see a little bit of activity locally and especially east of San Antonio. This is where we have most of the action right now. I mentioned earlier, especially in Wilson County, this is headed to the north toward Lavernia. We've got this one downpour near Lavernia and Stockdale, basically moving through Sutherland Springs right now. This is the heaviest shower that we have at the moment and embedded within the drizzle and light showers out there are a few of these pockets of actually heavy rainfall. That's where you see the red here right along Highway 87 over Sutherland Springs. Elsewhere, as we get into Bear County, it's just this really light green color on the radar, which is just that light sprinkle action and very light shower activity mixed in, of course, the areas of drizzle. We did have a few more moderate showers right along 281, basically downtown Alamo Heights and then northward up towards 1604. That was over the past hour and you see it, how it dissipated once it made it to the county line, even around the Stone Oak area. So there was a moderate shower earlier, but that's pretty much it out there for now. I anticipate this to continue though through the night. We'll continue to have these showers coming and going and notice how our rain chances peak around 8 a.m. tomorrow. That's when we bump them up to 80% tonight, just damp. But the storms I think will hold off until about 7 or 8 a.m. tomorrow morning. That is for San Antonio a little bit earlier, uh, farther to the west. And then notice how those rain chances really fall off. 11 a.m., noon, minimal chances. It should mainly be east of town. Okay, here's our future cast. We're going to spend a lot of time on this. More of what we have out there right now through the night. This is midnight. We go to 2 a.m., more of the same. 4 a.m., some showers out there. Then by 6 a.m. west of San Antonio, the storms are likely to flare up. Moving eastward, 7, 8 o'clock is when we're expecting them, you know, give or take a little bit through San Antonio and Bear County. And then thereafter, by 10, 11, most of it should be far east of town. So 11 a.m. tea time, I think you'll be okay in San Antonio and Bear County. Uh, it just the ground will still be fairly wet. And then even by the noon hour, it's pretty much out of our entire area and our sky clears on out. And of course, we'll take all the rain that we could get because we need it. Newest drought monitor. We've got the exceptional drought. Northeast, Bear County, Comal County, Guadalupe County, and that's the worst category. Now, there is the opportunity for a strong or, severe, strong or severe storm. There's that slight chance. Something we'll watch and keep you updated tomorrow morning. Rain ends around noon for just about all of us. I think we'll commonly see a quarter to a half an inch of rainfall with slightly higher amounts in some areas. Hey, mid 60s in the morning tomorrow. By the afternoon, sunny and well into the 70s, even near 80 degrees in some spots. And by the way, windy, those gusts up to 35 miles per hour. The weekend, feeling fall like right near 50 degrees with after in the mornings, then afternoons in the 70s and trick or treating weather looking like 70s and low humidity. All right, good stuff. Thank you, Adam. And but just while you're before you go to work tomorrow, just check in with uh, Stephen Cavazos, the traffic authorities, just so that you know what yeah, to deal be with safe the traffic on the yeah. roadways for sure. But Friday evening, it's looking good for Friday Night Lights. That is great to see because we have a lot of games because we're getting close to the finish of the regular season. There are only two weeks left in the regular season. When we come back, big game coverage tonight and kick off week 10. Look at that. Already defense feeling the offense right there, and SAFC is ready to kick off the playoffs coming up. Check out who vetted out to big game coverage tonight between Brandeis and Clark at Ferris Stadium. UTSA head football coach Jeff Trailer scouting on their bye week. Clark with the ball, but not very much longer here. There's trouble on the snap. The ball is on the ground. Dylan Cowan scoops it up for Brandeis and is taking it back 25 yards for the touchdown. 7 0. Brandeis. The Cougars claw their way back. Chris Gertz forces his way in from three yards out to even the game at 7 all. Second quarter now. Quarterback J.C. Evans standing tall in the pocket. He's able to find Rave. Clendenin over the middle, the 29-yard pitch and catch puts Brandeis back on top 14-7. To the final from Ferris, 35-28 Brandeis. Fresh off their win against the game, the Canyon Cougars hosting MacArthur tonight. New Braunfels, Cougars on the hunt in the first quarter. From the MAC 24-yard line, quarterback Deuce Adams drops back, fires into the sideline for Daniel Inman, who makes a nice catch. Tight ropes the sideline for the 7-0 lead in the final from Canyon, 43-14 Cougars. Tyvee making the trip from Kerrville as the second half begins against Veterans and Memorial tonight. The Patriots up 17-0 in third. The Anders keep up the fight. Diving the red zone, quarterback Kale Lackey hands it off to Logan Edmonds, who pitches it over to the receiver Jake Layton, who then finds Trevis 
Hyde wide open in the end zone with a 19-yard score. 17-6 Veterans Memorial. The final from Rutledge, 35-31. Tidy. Just up 281. We find McCollum Cowboys taking on the Brackenridge Eagles of the Rock Pile. First quarter. Cowboys deep in Eagle territory. Quarterback Justin Rodriguez rolls out to find Julian Roque in the flat. And turns up field and powers his way in. Nine yards out. The touchdown, 7-0 McCollum. Second quarter is 21-0 Cowboys before the Eagles answer. Running back Javier Carmargo, Carmargo bounces to the near side and dives in for the end zone to the Eagles on the board. The eight-yard touchdown cuts the Cowboys lead to 14. The final 45-14 McCollum. Pro football coverage. Powered by Davis Law Firm. Dallas Cowboys start running back Ezekiel Elliott. Missed his second straight practice today. Still nursing a sore right knee. Suffered the Cowboys 24-6 victory over Detroit last Sunday. That means Tony Pollard is expecting to start this Sunday against the Bears if Zeke is ruled out. Cowboys also added Micah Parsons to their injury report today. Dealing with a shoulder issue as well as Sam Williams. Dealing with a knee injury. Parsons listed as limited. Williams did not workout. Also, San Antonio's own Terrence Steele has been limited Wednesday and today with a neck injury. Dak Prescott is hoping for a hotter start against the Bears after not being able to score a single touchdown in the first half against Detroit last week. We're not getting first downs and we're going three and outs. The, the number of plays that we're getting go down and so we've got to do a better job of getting more first downs uh, and just getting more cracks at bat. Just uh, yeah, getting more plays and make, with more plays, more opportunities come for everybody. All right, Micah Parsons has been credited with an extra sack against the Lions, meaning he now has eight on the season. The Houston Astros will be sending Justin Verlander to the mound for their starting pitcher in game one of the 2022 World Series. As a result, 39-year-old will become only the second pitcher to start a World Series game in three different decades, joining Roger Clemens. He's previously started in 06 and 12 for the Detroit Tigers, and in 2017 and 19 for the Astros. But strangely enough, Verlander has never won a World Series game. He's 0-6 with an ERA of 5.68. He's hoping that changes tomorrow. I think Dusty and I both would like to check off... Uh you know, uh, my first World Series win, his first World Series championship. I think, um, you know, that'd be uh, a wonderful thing for us to have on our career list. Um, you know, I, I think I'm not, it's not my goal, though. My goal is not to go out there and win a baseball game. Um, you know, there's been games in the World Series that I don't deserve a win. There's been games that I thought I pitched well enough that we could get a win. It just didn't work out. It just, you know, at this point in the season, personal goals like that just don't matter. All right, it all starts tomorrow night in Houston with game one. Can the Trinity Tigers finish their regular season undefeated next? The Trinity Tigers football team is just three wins away from an undefeated season in the regular season. That's after they had gone off to a 7-0 start in 2022 under Jeremy Urban. That has been the norm, not the unusual, since they now have won 16 straight regular season games under his coaching. To being asked in the first round of the playoffs last year, they're using that as motivation to finish the season. I think it's not not much about success as it is um, experience. Uh, we had a lot of guys come back this year, and a lot of guys experienced the, the heartbreak in the playoffs, which before that we hadn't played in the playoffs in 10 years, I think. So a lot of experience coming from that game. We don't like the feeling of losing, and um, right now our goal is to just make it back to there. All right, face with their last major hurdle at center this Saturday at noon. And good luck to San Antonio FC tomorrow night when they host Oakland Roots FC in the Western Conference semifinals at Toyota Field at 7.30. That's after finishing with the best record in the United Soccer League, and they're on top seeding right now, heading into their first postseason match. They're a really talented team. It's you know you, you see that all over the league with the, the games that they've had this year. They've gotten some good results and they can beat anybody on any given day, which makes them really dangerous. And you know we're gonna it's gonna require us to have 100% focus. Oakland overall, they're, they're they're a good team and they're you know it doesn't matter that they that they finish seventh place in, in our conference. They they just beat the second place team. So obviously that's a team you gotta respect. All right, and their motto is Stephania, finish the fight right there. They'll have that for you tomorrow night at Toyota Field as well. We'll have the highlights for you tonight, tomorrow night on the Night Beat for you. Looking forward to it. They have their mind right. Don't take anybody easy in the playoffs. Not, not it's seven seed or anything. Right. You got that right. Thanks for that, Greg. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And we'll be right back after this. It has been a pleasure having you with us during this half hour. Thank you for joining us. Don't forget that Good Morning San Antonio starts tomorrow at 4.